At the end of the day, negotiation is also about deciding who gets what, how to distribute across the table the revenues or the cost, etc. And the more you've managed to create value in the first place, well, the more you need to be good at managing this competitive side of the negotiation. And here, it is important to know the usual bargaining tactics. Let me introduce them here in order for you to avoid using them, because they are slightly borderline and they could backfire. They could usually hurt the relationship and they have a short-term orientation which is contrary to your business long-term interest. But I will introduce them so that you can recognize them, encounter them if the uh, dark side of the force uses them against you. How to counter these techniques will usually rely on the following three ingredients. First, thanks to your preparation, have as much information as possible. Most manipulative tactics rely on information asymmetry. Second, build a relationship. These tactics, or dirty tricks, are used less frequently amongst negotiators that have a long-standing relationship. Third, insist on process. This is not how you intend to negotiate and you expect respect and reciprocity. Now for each of the following commonplace tactics, I will introduce how they work, the trick, why it is risky to use them, and most importantly, how to respond to them. Extreme anchoring is one of the most commonly used tactics. An unrealistic figure is thrown on the table in an attempt to anchor the discussion in a zone that is favorable to one side of the table. Now, if you do this yourself, the risk is that the other party simply leaves the table, under the impression that her solution away from the table is far more interesting than your offer. Another risk is that she responds with a counter-anchor, equally extreme, but on the other side, and then you enter into some sort of trench warfare. Now, the best way to handle extreme anchoring is to ask for justifications. Please help me understand how you come up with such a figure. Either it was sheer bluff, there's no justification, and then soon another more realistic offer will have to appear on the table. Or it wasn't bluff, and then you may want to consider your plan B. Making the other negotiate against himself or herself is pretty perverse. Imagine you've prepared a proposal in order to impress a potential new customer. In the first meeting, they tell you something like, well, probably you sent the wrong document, because this is so much below our expectations that there's no point discussing this today. Uh, but to give you a chance, why don't we meet in two days, and then in the meantime, you send us another, better, serious proposal. Now, be prepared for this scenario. Because most people will simply go back home and try to repair, improve the offer. So they're losing ground, but they got nothing as reciprocity. So be ready on the spot to ask for a counter offer from them, or at least try and grab for information. Help me improve my first offer by discussing now why it is not up to your expectations. Another classic technique is linkage, to add non-related issues. It consists of pulling a new demand out of nowhere and linking it to the existing stakes on the agenda. It usually works well because the other negotiators remain focused on the initial perimeter of the negotiation and they have not prepared anything about this unexpected new item. There are two ways to respond to linkage. If the power balance is comfortable, you may want to answer, well, I beg your pardon, but we had agreed to discuss A, B, and C, so the discussion will remain around A, B, and C. Full stop. But if the power balance does not allow you this approach, then try to propose, well, I'm perfectly happy to discuss this new item, D, and in order to give you fruitful answers on D, I need time to confer with my colleagues. So gain time to see what D exactly means or costs. A fourth commonplace tactic is the so-called red herring. A negotiator might pretend that a certain item is essential for herself, when in fact it is not. That is the red herring. And later in the discussion, 
that negotiator will painfully accept to forget about this item. In exchange, of course, for a concession on your behalf, which was her real target from the beginning. I strongly advise you not to use the red herring technique, because you might well end up with the item you pretended was so important for you. If you suspect that the other negotiator is making you run after the wrong target, be curious and dig deeper. Why do you want this? If legitimate motivations appear in a clear manner, it wasn't a red herring. If it remains blurred or illogical, there's probably a red herring. In the next video, I will discuss four more bargaining tactics straight from the dark side of the force, so stay tuned.